Hello. Welcome to the Politics and Letters podcast. I'm David Barfield with Jim Livingston. And today we're going to be speaking with Giannis Varoufakis, who is an economist and professor of economics at the University of Athens. He's also a politician and an author of numerous books. Most recently, he wrote the book titled Techno Feudalism What Killed Capitalism, which we will be discussing today. And with that, oh, here's the uh, show, everybody, the book. Uh, welcome, Giannis. Well, thank you so much, David. Thank you, Jim. It's um, a great pleasure to be in, in a position to discuss this with you. It's a, it, it's a audacious and uh, provocative title, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Um, can we can we begin? Um, and what we want to do is is uh, make sure that uh, our listeners, our viewers, uh, get some sense of you in the in the broadest possible way. So, if you could begin by just talking about. Uh, your career as an economist, but also how you got into politics, uh, especially with Syriza. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and then and the, the things that you're up to now, which I guess are part of the uh, D-I-E-M-25. -E -E I was in Carpe Diem, Jim. Carpe Diem. Okay, then. All right. <laughs> all right. Uh, it, it all began as a historical accident. And when I say it, I mean my political involvement. Before that, I was a very happy academic in the sense of uh, truly loving academia, uh, never intending to leave academia. Um, I used to be cooped up in my office, like so many academics, writing esoteric articles for another tw 20 people at most around the world <laughs> who actually read them. Uh, and the odd book for, you know, 500 people, max. But that was the intention. I, mean, I enjoyed doing esoteric stuff, like game theory, and, you know, mathematical models of, you know, social dynamics, which I knew were completely and utterly useless from the perspective of social policy of, uh, you know, in, term, in practical terms. It's a bit like, you know, dedicating yourself to playing chess. You don't do it because you think that there are practical applications of but, uh, and I always remained a political animal and very engaged politically wherever I was, in whichever country I was. I lived in the United Kingdom, in Australia, in the United States, in Belgium, uh, and of course here in Greece after 2000. And then around 2003, I started panicking, seriously panicking, because I felt that a tsunami was coming our way. Uh, I could see what was happening in Wall Street, City of London, Frankfurt, the banks in Paris, and I could see that our politicians were completely and utterly oblivious to what was going on. And I started writing articles and uh, some books as well, uh, warning about this, uh, our generation's 1929, which was very evident that it was coming. And then it came in 2008. And of course, it began with Lehman Brothers in the United States. And the equivalent of Lehman Brothers in Europe was Greece, the state of Greece. We were the subprime <laughs> victim or, you know, um, epicenter here in Europe. Uh, and then I, I gained some prominence because uh, I think the BBC found out that I used to be an advisor of the then Greek prime minister. And because I came out with a statement that we are bankrupt and we should embrace our bankruptcy and not try to conceal it by means of taking another credit card out, you, you can imagine that had journalistic value. So I, be, and, you know, right. I was thrust, without my knowledge even, uh, onto the public scene. And from that moment in 2009, 2010, I kept my mouth open. I kept speaking up against the, the what I call the inane, inane handling of an inevitable crisis by Europe, by the IMF, by Washington, and so on, by the G7, um, until at some point in 2014, very late 2014, a young man who was going to be Greece's prime minister in the next election, it was clear from the opinion polls, uh, um, said that he agrees with what I am suggesting, but he can only do it if I join his cabinet as a finance minister. And I thought, oops, <laughs> what do we do now? A moral dilemma hit and uh, decided I would never forgive myself if I didn't have a go at it. That uh, experiment lasted for six months because this political system ejected me. 
simply because the political system in Europe was absolutely determined to give Greece another credit card on conditions right. of austerity that would shrink the income that was incapable of repaying the previous credit cards. A complete catastrophe. Uh, and, you know, I could have stayed on if I had uh, signed uh, the lease, the lease, you know, the, the contract for the new credit card. And I refused to do that and I resigned. But I stayed in politics because for a very simple reason. Uh, as long as there are people out there who stop me on the street, not just in Greece, but outside of Greece as well, and say, look, don't give up. We need something like this. We need a voice like this to present us. You know, when I was in academia and I was in my office, I, I didn't have that kind of pressure. <laughs> but, you know, because of this historical accident, um, I am subject to this pressure. And uh, right. it continues. All right. Wow. Well, I... <laughs> Again, yeah, we're glad to have you with us on our side. How's that? That's, that? At least that's how we think of you now. Um, David, did you did you have a question now, or do you uh, want me to go ahead? Just with respect to the book, um, as you mentioned, the subheading subtitle is a provocative uh, claim that you make. And I was wondering if we could start with a definition as you see it of what feudalism is specifically, what it was historically and how that um, that past is being replicated today in terms of, uh, I guess, the specific uh, uh, economic relations, production relations, or in social. Let me get one thing absolutely clear. I do not, I'm not suggesting that we're going back in time, right. that we went from capitalism to an earlier mode of production. Uh, Techno-feudalism may share the word feudalism with what preceded capitalism, but it's, in my view, it is a completely new phase uh, in human history. It's a, it's, it's a step beyond capitalism. Uh, not a better, not improvement, right? <laughs> but not a return to something that uh, existed before. I think the important starting point is uh, to define capitalism. I mean, feudalism is really very simple to define. Right. Feudalism is a system of production and distribution based on land ownership, uh, uh, property rights over land by feudal lords, uh, which allow them, afford them, the extractive power, the power to extract surplus or rent directly from the producers, from the peasants. Uh, I think that's quite straightforward. So it's land, ownership of land, and rent being the source of wealth, of wealth accumulation. Uh, so all the great cathedrals of Europe and so on were <laughs> built on the basis of rent extracted uh, by those who had the property rights over the land. Uh, with capitalism, you have uh, the shift, the great transformation, as Polanyi put it, uh, the shift from uh, land ownership to machine ownership. And the source of wealth was no longer rent, even though rent continue to exist and grow and be important, uh, it was profit, entrepreneurial capitalist profit. From that perspective, capitalism, for me, when I say capitalism has been killed, what exactly do I mean? Wherever you look outside our window, you see capitalism, you see capital, you see markets, you can see, you know, uh, profits, uh, uh, accumulation of wealth and inequality and so on. But when I say that capitalism was, was killed, I'm defining capitalism analytically and clearly, I think, by saying that it is a socioeconomic mode of production where, if not all, most of economic activity goes through markets. And the fuel of the system is not rent, as it was in feudalism, but it is profit. Those two pillars of capitalism, markets and profits, uh, in my estimation, are no longer at the epicenter, at the center of the socioeconomic mode of production we are. There are markets, of course, there are markets everywhere. And, but they were, the, the markets existed um, uh, under the Phoenicians, under the ancient Athenians, under the Mycenaeans. Markets have always been here. What capitalism did was to push most of economic activity through markets. Okay, Now, they have been replaced by uh, platforms, by what I call cloud thieves. They live in the cloud, like Amazon.com. And profit, which of course still exists and it's still a major motive for people to do things, 
uh, and usually bad things. But nevertheless, again, profit, which always existed, uh, is a, once more on the sidelines, on the margins. It has been replaced by a new form of rent, which I call cloud rent. Uh, essentially, a rent that is extracted by the owners of the digital platforms, uh, on the one hand, and central bank money, which since 2009 has been uh, printed under so-called so, so quantitative easing methods, uh, around $35 trillion, uh, in order to replenish the Find you know, the, the, you know the, those pyramids of financialization that collapsed after 2008, but essentially, the state was providing the liquidity for the new cloud thieves, the digital platforms, to replace markets. So, to conclude a long answer to your succinct question, I would say this: that under feudalism you inherited the right to extract rent. You had nothing to do, no, you didn't have to do anything. If you, if you were a member of the aristocracy, right? You inherited the property rights which allowed you to extract rent from the peasants. Today, there's no such thing. Um, you know, Jeff Bezos and Zuckerberg and Elon Musk and so on, had, they, they acted as capitalists. They had to invest huge quantity of money into creating the fiefdoms that allow them to charge rents. These fiefdoms are digital fiefdoms. That's why I call them cloud fiefdoms or cloud fiefs. And the rents that they charge are cloud rents. So this is the two profound differences with feudalism. One is that the fiefdoms are based on high tech, um, high technologies and serious investment in uh, digital technologies. They are not inherited. That's a a great difference from feudalism. And the second di um, difference is that the capital stock, which is essential for techno feudalism, and that's also a difference with capitalism, is to a very large extent reproduced by the whole of society, what I call cloud serfs. People who are, through serious labor, unpaid labor, but very serious and intense labor. Maybe it's voluntary. Maybe they do it enthusiastic. It doesn't matter. When you upload videos on TikTok, you're working. And you are working for TikTok. Essentially, you are reproducing. You are building up, accumulating the capital stock, the cloud <clears throat> capital stock, TikTok. So to, to cut a long story short, the transformation from feudalism to capitalism involved a shift from land to capital, to machinery, to capital goods, produce means of production which allowed wealth accumulation to go from um, the charging of ground rents to the extraction of surplus value, in Marxist terms, capitalist profits. And the shift from capitalism to techno-feudalism happened because of this uh, remarkable mutation of capital into a new form of capital, which I call cloud capital, which is not a produced means of production, but it is a produced means of behavioral modification. Uh, that's what Amazon.com does. It doesn't produce anything except to modify your behavior and mind, whether we are producers, consumers, advertisers, members of the public, uploading reviews, whatever. And the creation of this cloud capital granted the owners of cloud capital the capacity to extract massive cloud rents from the general public, proletarians, think of what's happening in an Amazon warehouse, and very importantly, from capitalists who pay up to 40% of the price they receive to people like Jeff Bezos for the privilege of reaching their customers. That's a very nice parallel to ground rent, only it is cloud rent. Can I can I uh, see if I can summarize that um, in 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 four ways and see see if you if you would agree with this, and and this I think works as a kind of a sequence. Um, so that, so that for me in listening to you and reading the book and reviewing the book, um, I would say there's four elements to this, this techno feudalism you're talking about to begin with the, the dematerialization of assets, because you suggested that 
It was the ownership of machinery that distinguished capitalists from feudal lords. Second um, would be that uh, consumption replaces uh, goods production, if you will, uh, in the production of surplus. So that consumers, after hours, are actually producing the goods that uh, are reaped, harvested, if you will, by these digital platforms, <clears throat> these fiefdoms, as you call them. And that's a huge change from what the proletariat was supposed to be doing, and in fact did do. Third, then, and this, this would, uh, I think, recall and perhaps amplify your reference to Polanyi, that if that is true, that, that the, the social stratum uh, that is now producing the surplus is not just the proletariat, not just what we used to call the working class, but consumers and such, is that that, that would render the key element in the Marxian schema, the Marxian telos, as you might put it, uh, moot. And then finally, um, and I think this is the, this is the, the key point that I that I uh, hope we can return to, and I think it's it's a crucial moment in in your book, something that we all have to start thinking about is that in the end the, the surplus <clears throat> that these digital platforms these fiefdoms uh, are after and are reaping from our unconscious efforts is precisely behavior. So um, now I think that, I mean, I wish I could go back now and, and rewrite the review in these terms because to me, what you've said and what you've written here, those four elements are, are much more, not more, but they are, they are uh, to me, who began with some skepticism in reading your book, uh, these are really, really convincing. These are, these are, these are, um, um, to me, the salient points that, that really need to, uh, that you need and we need to get out there. So is that, a, do you think, do you think that's a fair? Of course it's fair. I'm not sure I, I concur, but uh, okay. it's a very interesting way of, I'm, I'm, I benefit from hearing this reinterpretation or interpretation of what I'm doing. Let me um, address each one of those four points and then add my own. Uh, okay. The first one, dematerialization. Well, you know, cloud capital sounds like something that lives up in the ether, in the cloud, but it is really material stuff. Um, I don't know whether you've ever been into a server farm, farm but yeah. it's a fact. I have. I have um, in Washington State in a Microsoft uh, server farm, and I was struck by how primitive it looks and feels and sounds and smells. It's, it's a factory. You walk in there and it is a, it's a factory. If you look at all the optic fiber cables crisscrossing the oceans, if you look at the cell towers, uh, so it's real material capital. It's not ethereal capital. Okay. Uh, so let's be let's let, let's go soft on the dematerialization idea just because we don't see it as uh, members of the public, as consumers, doesn't mean that it's 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 not material. It is very material. Okay. Um, the second point about consumers, you're completely right. Uh, but I would put it a bit even more radically. I would say that the, you know, when we teach economics, when I used to teach economics to students, uh, the standard textbook has this um, demarcation between consumption theory and production theory. The producers and consumers. I think that what cloud capital has done is that it has broken this down. Yeah. So um, we, I mentioned the example before of um, uploading a video on TikTok. It could be a book review on Amazon. Uh, what exactly are you doing at that moment? I mean, clearly, to be uploading, a, 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 you know, when my daughter uploads a video, she does it for fun. So that's anyone can consider that to be an act of consumption in the standard right. microeconomic, old-fashioned way of thinking of things, right? right? But if you are the owner of TikTok, right, <laughs> or a part owner, a shareholder of TikTok, you see what you know my daughter does, or your daughter, or whoever, and says, "Okay, good, my capital has been added to." Yeah, somebody has produced another bit 
of my capital, or you know, you better buy it with a Y, right? Uh, so essentially, I don't think it helps to, to to make this distinction between consumption and production anymore. Uh, the third point about the Marxist process being moot, I don't think so at all. You see, it may. I don't think this is good what I'm going to say for the chances that my book will have to convince many people because Marx still doesn't have a very good reputation, especially in the United States. But I consider my, my analysis to be a Marxist one. And I don't believe that the Marxist way of thinking is moot. Because you see, especially if you read the, there's an appendix at the, at the end in which I provide the Marxian political economy of my argument. This is for nerds, this is for people like us, right? Not for the general public. But I wanted it to be there so that anybody who wants to see exactly what my political economics is can go there. In the, there, I even have a diagram in which I explain that. All surplus value, in my estimation, right? I mean, could be completely wrong, but in my theory, in my book, all surplus value is produced in the capital sector to this day. So the techno feudal sector does not produce surplus value. Uh, but what happens is it, it is parasitic on the capitalist sector, which it has taken over. It has usurped. It has uh, uh, effectively subsumed. So you have an increasingly, well, a, 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 a constantly diminishing capitalist sector producing all the surplus value, which is being redistributed through cloud capital. That's that's the point I'm making. So cloud capital. That's why I'm saying it is a produced means of behavioral modification. It's not producing anything. Therefore, in my estimation, as an unreconstructed Marxist, it cannot produce value. But it helps in an almighty fashion, redistributed, you know, extracted. Uh, think about feudalism. In feudalism, you had capital. You had vassal capitalists. You know, they were entrepreneurs working in the fief. Um, they were vassals. <laughs> in other words, they had... Um, surrendered to the Lord the right, the Lord's right, to extract surplus from them. Hmm? So this is like exactly what's happening here. So I don't think that the maximum point is moot. Um, as for uh, the last point was... That they're producing it, behavior. More or less the same. It was yes, more or less right. same. The way right. I understand it, Jim, is this. We have a new form of capital. This new form of capital can do lots of different things. It can, through its capacity to modi modify our, our behavior, it can arrest our attention, like, you know, Don Draper in Mad Men did, you know, the right. standard clever advertising. Yeah? But this is automated. This is not the human being that arrests our attention with a clever idea. This is uh, Alexa or Siri, or, uh, you know, the algorithm. Arrest our attention, first thing. Second thing it does, it, it, it trains us to train it, to train us, to train it, to train us, to train it ad infinitum, infinite regress, so that it knows us so well that it gives us recommendations that are really good recommendations. They destroy the Hayekian argument that there's no, there can be no central centralized system that can know us. Can know our preferences right. and our capacities. No, there is. It's called Alexa, right? And through these good recommendations, it can tell us what we want. Because you know, after it has recommended ten books to you that you actually liked, enjoyed reading, the eleventh it will recommend you want to buy. I want. I do, and I'm never. And Alexa is never wrong, right? Spotify tells me, you know, listen to this piece of music, and. Maybe I'm not going to be extremely enthusiastic about it, but I never say, oh, what, what kind of stupid recommendation that was. It was always, it's always interesting music that Spotify recommends to me, right. especially after the, the <laughs> algorithm learned my, you know, my ways uh, over the right. years. Right. So it arrests our attention. It um, um, inputs desires into us. That's the second thing. And the third thing it does, it directly sells us what we desire now, Bypassing markets, because the same algorithm, once, you know, we say, oh, yeah, yeah okay, I'll buy that book. It, uh, Amazon.com is not a market. I insist it's a trading platform. It is a huge digital trading fiefdom, uh, but it is not a marketplace. And we, we can discuss, if you want, what how, how I define the market. But the, primarily the market is decentralized. Uh, 
whereas right. every digital platform is exactly the opposite. It's like it's a dream come true for the Soviet Union's ghost plan. <laughs> a centralized system that matches one person with another person. It's what Gosplan would have loved to have, but never got uh, the technology to do, right? right. Uh, so that's the third thing it does. The fourth thing it does, it speeds up proletarian labor. So if you if you go into a, 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 an ample factory in Austin, Texas today, where they make right. the laptops, or if you go into an Amazon warehouse where proletarians, precariat, precariously employed proletarians are running around um, taking one box from here and putting it there, right? They all have a digital device um, attached to their wrist which monitors what they do and tells them where to go and starts beeping faster if they're not moving fast enough. And it's the same algorithm that is running Alexa. So they arrest our attention. They even put desires in our head. They sell us the stuff directly. They speed up proletarian labor. And they make us work as non those of us who are not proletarians or the proletarians during their off time, during their leisure time, right? To work to build, rebuild that cloud capital. Right. Folks, that's not capitalism. <laughs> I insist that, that, that it's not helpful to, to think of this as, you know, digital platform capitalism, entire capitalism, monopoly capitalism. Okay, it's not wrong technically to call it anything like that. In the same way that it wouldn't be wrong to call capitalism, you know, market feudalism or industrial mm -hmm. feudalism. But it would not help our minds come to terms with the major great transformation that has taken place. Okay. David. Well, you mentioned Don Draper and the, the admin of the past. So, I mean, basically, it seemed to me when I was reading that section that it's um it's their work speeded up i mean all the things that it that alexa does currently are the things that well they may not have done it as accurately um but it is the same project is it not of what advertising was in the past and that, and that now the, the rapidity with which it, it does it is really the key, or is there something? I don't, think the, I don't think it's the speed that is the key. The speed is given. What what I think is the key is this. Of course, you know, Don Draper and Alexa are in the same business. They're in the business of making us want things that we neither need nor want, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> but this this was the game, the case from time immemorial. Um, priests, authors, poets, politicians, orators, advertisers, they've always wanted to modify our behavior. Uh, we want, as academics, we, that's what we want. We want to modify, you know, to, to put ideas into our, our students' heads. That, right. That's not at all, I mean, it's part of being human. But it's not speed that makes Alexa different, qualitatively different to Don Draper, David. It's the dialectic. Don Draper came up with an idea. He created a television advertisement or a poster huh? or something, some, some kind of write-up in, in a newspaper, you know, a classified advertisement or paid advertisement. And then that piece of work, you know, entered your eyes or your ears, if it was on the radio, and in, and 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 it infected you with a with with a desire, one way. End of story. Then, if it worked, you would go out to a shop and you would buy the stuff, right? The remarkable transformation, the true change that algorithms have brought, is this infinite regress, the Hegelian dialectic between the machine and you. So the machine gives you stimuli, right? You respond to those to stimuli that changes, that, that informs the machine, then it gives you more stimuli. And there is a, this backwards and forwards, not just two way, but infinite regress between the machine and you. So you are training it to train you, to train it to train you. Don Draper never had that. Right. For Don Draper was one way, this is two ways and non-stop. The fact that it is quick is also important, but it is not the central point. Okay. Wow. 
All right, so let's, if I may, um, let's return to the, to the question of periodization um, with, with, with what I find in the book to be um, uh, moral connotations or possibilities. Okay, so if I may, I'll quote from the book and then we'll take it from there. And I hope, I hope this will lead you back to um, the inspiration of Mackenzie Warwick uh, in, yep. in, writing, in writing your book, because I think that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting angle for um, the non-nerds among us, <laughs> because, you know, I mean, she, she writes for, I think, an audience that may not be uh, quite as, uh, what, technophile or, or techno uh, fear. Uh, as we are. Anyway, let me read you these quotes. These are from uh, pages 112, 13, and then 125. Um, quote, uh, to use the language of early economists like Adam Smith, it is a classic case of feudal rent defeating capitalist profit, of wealth extraction by those who already have it triumphing over the creation of new wealth by entrepreneurs. Now, in the review, I say, does that sound like that the author is um, uh, saying that that capitalism can can claim a higher moral ground, and then and then I use this quote: "Capitalism prevailed over pro when profit overwhelmed rent, a historic triumph coinciding with the transformation of productive work and property rights into commodities to be sold by labor and share markets, respectively. It was not just an economic victory, whereas rent reeked of vulgar exploitation." Profit claimed moral superiority as a just reward to brave entrepreneurs risking everything to navigate the treacherous currents of stormy markets. Now, I noticed there, there's some irony there, of course, but um, it is interesting that, that um, it seems to me that the, the, the parallel, at least, in, in your suggestion that, uh, that feudal, techno feudalism is parasitic on capitalism. Uh, reminds me very much of the arguments against finance capital at the turn of the 20th century, that the banks were taking over manufacturing and, and perverting its productive purposes and so forth. So I wonder if you could, I wonder if you could take us there and, and talk about these, you know, again, these moral connotations and in the hope that it will lead you back towards, uh, towards works, uh, work and, and any amplification that you would like to uh, provide sure. in, in answer to David's question too. Look, uh, as I indicated before, um, because I, I didn't start life imagining myself as an economist, I was, uh, you know, as, a, as a kid, I wanted to be a physicist. Um, then I decided to be a mathematician. I thought I escaped economics altogether and uh, didn't study economics really uh, until by an accident. Um, I, when I was doing my master's thesis, I came across an economics article in the American Economic Review, which infuriated me so much that I wrote a rebuttal, which um, happened to be published in the Economics Journal. And uh, from that moment onwards, as I was doing my PhD, um, I started getting um, you know, job offers from economics departments. So it's a complete accident, right? In the meantime, my education in economics was Marx, Ricardo, Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, John, um, um, many, it's, you know, um, Keynes, and so on and so forth. But I was self-educated. And then what I learned about neoclassical economics was as a lecturer in neoclassical economics, which is the best way of learning it, <laughs> by teaching the, the thing. I'm telling you this because as somebody who was on the left, from a very young age, has to do with my family, with my father, with my mother, and so on and so forth. Um, the first economics text I really got hold of was, um, in a sense, um, Das Kapital by Marx and the Communist Manifesto. If you read the first three, four pages of the Communist Manifesto, it's a pian, a eulogy of capitalism. Okay, it's ironic as well. So you know, you you, you were very right, Jim, to to. to you know, capture this uh, irony, the ironic celebration of capitalism as uh, a system that um, unshackles us from the idiocy of rural life, from, uh, you know, the prejudices uh, of uh, feudal society. Now, I actually endorse that. I wouldn't want to live under feudalism. I would not want to live 
you know, in a theocratic uh, um, backward uh, society where the Lord was my master and, you know, and, and I was a religious freak, right? So I do believe in the emancipatory uh, contribution of capital accumulation in society. Uh, the, crit the criticism of Marx and the criticism of which I adopted from a very young age, from the age of 12, 13, was that uh, capitalism was not going far enough. It was not liberating us enough. Um, the, 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 the means of production that it was creating, the fantastic technologies that could have liberated us ended up not only frustrating us, but enslaving us. Instead of them becoming our mechanical slaves, we became their mechanical slaves. And in particular, I love the Hegelian dialectic in Marx, where he actually showed a remarkable sympathy to the plight of capitalists, because the capitalists also fell prey to the logic of capital accumulation. In the end, they were sad bastards. They never enjoyed life because, you know, the, the great fear was going bankrupt. And they never they accumulate like Scrooge, right, in uh, uh, in a Christmas Carol. Um, so I'm saying all this because you are bringing in the moral high ground, the, the moral comparison. Um, uh, so, yeah, and, and if you think, you know, even, even Winston Churchill, you can't, be more right wing than him, especially right. before he became prime minister. Right? Um, he was uh, completely adamant against rent seeking, against rent rentiers. This was the liberal conservative tradition, uh, mm -hmm. beginning with David Ricardo, who saw rent as uh, uh, essentially essentially a black hole in which the energies of capital accumulation disappeared, giving rise to slumps, to crisis, to, to discontent, to regression back to, feud, to feudalism. And I share that. I really, I really do share that. I mean, in, here in, you know, in the area of Athens where I live, I can see what Airbnb is doing. You know, it's driving rats up. Um, um, you know, there's a, there was a beautiful little restaurant, Taverna, near here, which... Um, had to shut down because it could not compete with, uh, you know, more ladida, uh, upmarket gentrified uh, outlets, which are soulless at the same time. Now, of course, that little entrepreneur who lost his taverna is gone, but the owner of the building in which the taverna was uh, benefits from his bankruptcy because the next vendor, who is going to be more ladida and so on, is going to pay a higher rent. So this uh, rentier didn't have to do anything, didn't have to create food, either of the old fashioned variety or the gentrified. He, he just gets rich in his sleep, which is, if you want, um, it goes against both the Marxist ethic and the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, to go over, right? <laughs> so in that sense, I think you're right. There is this um, moral, indignation with any economic or historical force that shifts us back to, 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 to uh, rent and rentiers. Um, but you asked me to, to, to comment on, on Mackenzie Walk, and I have to say that reading her book made me very happy because I had already started playing around with the idea of technofeudalism before I read the book, her book. Um, Maybe uh, this is, I'm breaking some news here, uh, <laughs> minor news, uh, by telling you that my ideas about techno-feudalism began to take form and shape when in 2011, 2000, 2012, I spent a little bit of time, about a year, working for a video game company in Bellevue, uh, just outside Seattle. Uh, and I saw the emergence of trading platforms, um, digital money, mm -hmm. uh, cloud surfs in a community of video games, of video game play players. So I started developing this whole idea. Then I could see that, you know, nine out of every ten dollars that um, went into creating Facebook came from QE money, from quantity vision. Uh, that reminded me of the importance of the king in England, 
and the treasury in providing <laughs> the liquidity to the, the laws. So my yeah. ideas had all started percolating. And then well into, I, I had already started writing, I had already written half half my book, the one you have in front of you. And that's when I read uh, Capital is Dead by Mackenzie Work. And I thought, great, I'm not the only madman here. <laughs> there is a there is another mad person, at least, at least one other mad person. And Cory Doctorow is another one that uh, has informed my thinking about all those things. Uh, the difference with Mackenzie Walk, I mean, I think that Mackenzie Walk has come up with most of the ideas that I've come up with. Uh, and maybe she did it before me. Uh, but there's one which I think is importantly different. Um, she's talking about the death of capital and the rise of what she calls the, 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 the vector, right? For me, that is not helpful because what we have is a new form of capital. Capital is not dying, capitalism died. And it was killed by its own hand, by a mutant version, version of capital. And I think that is very important uh, in terms of our thinking, as well as it is important to, to um, to embed the existing terrestrial capital, produce means of production, in a broader scheme where another form of capital is uh, putting all its power into modi modifying behave behavior. Got it. Yeah. David, you want to follow up with it or you got a different tack? Uh, well, I'm more we're pushing the end, but I did want to get into a little bit about, if, as long as we were talking about Marxism, I, it's uh, it's always um, the first thing that pops into my head when I think of Marx and Marxism is a is a is a teleology, right? That everybody adhered to in the past. Um, you you speak a little bit in the book about, um, or some in the book about um, about politics and how we might uh, combat this. And perhaps what's next mm -hmm. for us? What sh what should a left? I know that the left, a left is in big trouble. We don't really have, at least in the United yeah. States or internationally, nothing nothing percolating percolating out there. Yeah, uh, but let's we don't have to get bogged down in how terrible things are. Like what would be, and maybe in terms of your no. organization, uh, what would be a model for pushing on to the next stage um whatever that is maybe a second yeah. liberal capitalist revolution or uh, uh i don't know that's gone that's cloud capital has made sure that there will be no second liberal capitalist revolution okay. look uh, you mentioned one word which i need to latch on to teleology yeah uh i reject max teleology a hundred percent, and I think he rejected it too, because you know Marx is 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 a prisoner of the nineteenth century, because that's his century, uh, uh, at a time when there was a a lot of optimism uh, regarding the, the capacity of history to produce improvements, this the, this the modernist spirit. Now, I. Things it's really very to just jettison the the inherent optimism in the modernist strands, which are teleological in Marx. Uh, I see there is no guarantee that things will get better, right. that the next socioeconomic mode of production will be best. For me, Rosa Luxemburg put it brilliantly when from within her cell, prison cell, she put to us the great dilemma and the great question, which is unanswered and unanswerable. Socialism or barbarism? There's no teleology involved in that. Uh, we have agency. Um, if you put a gun on my head and you ask me to predict what will happen, please don't do it because the answer is not going to be very happy. Right. Um, I, think we're, I think we're fucked, excuse my French, as a species. I think that we are probably beyond the point of no return in terms of climate uh, uh, catastrophe. I think that you know the planet will shed us like dead skin the way we're moving. Um, we're going from bad to worse. Um, 
organized labor is uh, losing left, right, and center. Um, we is things are not looking good. But at the very same time, I don't care. I care, but I, it doesn't affect what I do. Right. Uh, it doesn't affect what I do. Why? Because to begin with, you know, I wake up every morning knowing that I'm going to die. Not today, but someday. That doesn't stop me from doing things today. Also, I have this strong ethical commitment not to predict the social future. You know, because if you're if you're practicing meteorology, your job is prediction. That's your job. That's what you should be doing. You should be judged by how well you predict the weather. That's the job of the meteorologist, right? But the, the reason why you can do it uh, happily and, you know, with a clear conscience and well, reasonably well, increasingly well, is because the weather doesn't give a damn about our theories regarding the weather. The weather will be whatever the weather will be. It it, it does not respond to average opinion of meteorologists or to average opinion as influenced by meteorologists. Therefore, you've got this splendid isolation between the phenomenon and the theory about the phenomenon. In society, we don't have that. Our theory about society informs what we do and therefore shapes the history of society. <laughs> so the phenomenon and the theory about the phenomenon Okay, social theory, in other words, um, is structured in such a dialectical way that we don't have the moral right to predict. We should simply act on the basis of what we consider to be right. And, you know, for the hell of it. That's why I'm involved in politics. You know, um, I'm going from one political defeat to the next. From one political defeat to the next. From the moment I was finance minister, defeated. Then we created the DiEM25, the Democracy in Europe movement across Europe. Um, we ran in the European Parliament elections 2019. Uh, we will run again 2000 from now in next June. We lost in 2019. We'll probably lose again now. So what? We continue. We carry on the same way that we wake up in the morning and we try to do our best to have fun while we're doing what we think is right. That's my that's my very simplistic emotional political ideology right uh when it comes to what could we do as a movement whether this is here in europe or you folks in the united states or internationally well firstly i think that is absolutely essential uh not to be parochial this is why back in 2018 um uh Bernie Sanders and I in uh, Vermont uh, inaugurated something we call the Progressive International, which is linked to the book somehow, because uh, I don't know, maybe you've noticed that every Black Friday we have the hashtag make Amazon pay. This is a Progressive International initiative, which we, we do not present as a Progressive International initiative. Uh, but I think it is really very important. And it's only early days because I think that the way we're going to change the world, if we're going to change it, is by restructuring the calculus of collective action. If you think of you know, the early trades unions of the 19th century, it was absolutely stupendous. The sacrifice that those pe people made, because you know, you're going, going up against uh, the owner of a mine or, the, or a factory. Yeah. Or if you are in Australia, you are a um, uh, shearer and you go against the landlord who owns all the sheep, right? Uh, what are the chances that through this collective action, through this strike, you're going to benefit? You and your family is going to benefit? Vanishingly small, very close to zero. And what are the costs that you have to suffer? Huge. And the costs are given. They are very large. The, <laughs> the benefits are vanishingly small. And even if they come, the scabs will get it too. The, you know, the, the ones who break the strike will get it too. So that, that's what, you know, it's it's remarkable that given this the, this balance of cost-benefit in collective mm -hmm. action, with the cost being so large and so certain and the benefits being so small and so uncertain, that there was a labor movement, that there was a progressive movement, that people did bind together to oppose... Uh, the exorbitant power of the very, very few of the oligarchs. Uh, 
I think it's important to change that calculation, that that cost benefit. So in uh, in my previous book, which was a a novel, a science fiction novel, which I wrote, just to answer your question, Dave. Yeah. How could we have done things differently, and how can we do things differently so as to, you know, with given technologies, not with Star Trek like technology, with the technology we have now, with uh, you know, the fallen nature of women and men uh, as we are. How could we have done things differently? So in, and I forced myself to write that science fiction novel in order to answer the question. So after 2008, what could we have done differently instead of Occupy Wall Street, which was pathetic? You know, we spent five hours debating on whether we should be selling sandwiches uh, or not. Yeah, <laughs> remember? <laughs> uh, what I'm could we have done differently? There, but I, I've heard stories. Yeah, yeah. It was it was fun, but it was pathetic at the same time. <laughs> you know, Goldman Sachs was laughing at us. Um, anyway, um, so I think that transnational, that's Amazon, make Amazon pay the campaign, transnational, international campaigns that use cloud capital against the owners of cloud capital, which concentrate on the local was happening in a particular warehouse, in a particular Amazon warehouse in New, you know, in Staten Island in New Jersey, you know, Chris Smalls, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, combined with uh, collective campaigns to refuse payment to public privatized public utilities, for instance. Imagine if in in England or in France or here in Greece, we could. I mean, technically, it's possible to do this. We were to find out which derivatives, which CDOs contain, uh, which uh, securitized future receipts of, of, from water boards, from electricity stations, and so on. And imagine when, if if we knew that you know, a particular CDO is susceptible to an income stream, let's say next March, if if we organized um, uh, with withhold your electricity bill payments for that one month and we will crowdsource whatever penalties you pay you attack that particular derivative in the stock exchange while you're attacking amazon through a make amazon pay you link trade unions with consumer boycotts you target companies that for instance um you know jeff bezos enterprises in malaysia uh, or Indonesia, they are buying up as we speak more than three million rooms. That is small retailers turning them into microcredit loan sharks. Right. It is perfectly possible to organize an international, transnational movement which uses the modern technologies to create solidarity both at the local and the national level, while building up, inter you know organizations like Progressive International, like DiEM25. You know, what is special about DiEM25, even though we didn't win in the elections in 2019, is that we are the first European movement where, you know, you join not as a Greek or a French person or a German or an Italian, but you, you join as a as a European. And uh, there are no branches, you know, it's not a federal system. It is a, a totally transnational system. I think that that is the way to go. It's very early days. Uh, we can focus on the half full or the half empty aspect of the particular glass. Um, in Europe, we, as we speak, DM25, we have 145,000 members, which is not zero, but it's not great either. Um, the Progressive International, the affiliated members of the Progressive International, we are now at 200 million members. Um, it's not hopeless. But there is no ground for optimism. Hope. So hope without optimism. Right. Well, the, you know, the, your two examples of Sanders and uh, Occupy, to me, I mean, if, if nothing else, uh, indicate that there is the sentiment is out there. People do believe it's a, in justice. It, it's a question of uh, the work of organizing, I suppose, and uh, what what might be effective. And it's also important to understand that the social democratic project is over. The New Deal project is over because of the rise of cloud capital. That's why I'm insisting, you right. know, that 
with my provocation that capitalism is dead. Because as long as you think that capitalism is dead and is functioning and it's okay, it's got its problems and so on, you can think of civilizing it, like the New Deal did. The New Deal was fantastic at doing that. Yeah, uh, But then financialization, the tearing up of every rule and regulation shackling the bankers, unleashed financialization, the crash of financialization in the year 2000 unleashed QE, in combination with the privatization of the internet that created cloud capital. And cloud capital is uh, primed to poison uh, all our conversations on the one hand, while making it impossible when you have, when, you know, when, when you have, you don't have any more, you know, Henry Ford on the one side and proletarians working on the production side, uh, lines on the other side. You have Jeff Bezos, who's not producing anything, he doesn't give a damn. He's, he's never going to sit down. No government can make him sit down and debate, negotiate with some trade union because he's not producing anything. Very soon, there will be no Chris Smalls working in Amazon warehouses. It will be automated robots. He doesn't need even proletarians in the warehousing. Right? There will be aut autonomous driving systems and uh, mechanical robots driven by the same algorithm that is driving Alexa, which is putting things into your head. Which means, of course, that the macroeconomic crisis is going to get much worse because when you've got you know, a shrinking capitalist sector producing less and less surplus value and the basis of the world extract more and more of it, they pull it out of the circular flow of income. So you need central banks then to keep printing money in order to stabilize the system. That means that they have the current conundrum of inflation on the one hand, but not being able to stop printing um, to, to, to reduce the size of their asset book. Uh, because if they do that, then the whole system collapses. Now, this system is taking us over the cliff as a species. And if you add to that, you know, the climate catastrophe. And some people say to me, but Yanis, there's not much about the climate catastrophe in your, in your book. And I said, no, there isn't. But think about it. How can we organize against the fossil fuel industry when our means of communication are de dependent on algorithms primed to poison the conversation between us? Well, and no taxation can solve this. We need to appropriate the means of production, distribution, and communication. Can I? Can I, I'm, I, I'm not sure uh, how close we are. I, I think we're almost at our deadline. But I, I mean, this to me is a perfect way of, of uh, winding up because when you say that we need to reconfigure the calculus of political action, and you speak in terms of transnational uh, uses of cloud capital against cloud capital, um, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, and one of the ways to do that, it seems to me, is that. To think of the financial system, you know, the axis of fi financialization, as a first step, because we—that is to say, the taxpayers, at least in the United States—already own the banking system through FDIC, the bailout of 2009, 2010, and so forth and so on. So, if we could move then to not nationalize but to socialize the banking system, that would be a huge step, it seems to me. Okay, so. So, so now I'm thinking, you know, towards the end of your book, when you talk about the politics of of, uh, of the future, um, I'm struck by by the difference between what you're just saying, which I'm completely on board with, and and the proposals here, uh, which appear as an alternative to traditionally social democratic organizing and so forth, the kind of things that, that David was talking about where you talk about how cooperative arrangements at the level of the firm are going to be crucial to uh, the democratization that we all hope for. I wonder if you could, I wonder if you could speak to that, um, that disjuncture, if you will. In the book, we're talking about uh, the level of the firm, you know, which is the older traditional terrain of the strike. And on the other, these new initiatives of yours, which sound to me, at least, a great deal more promising um, than that. Is that is that a way of concluding our, uh, yes, our discussion? I, I I see the two as one. Okay. For me, they are one project. Because okay. you see, when I describe how um, you know, a corporation could operate 
uh, as a proper cooperative, you know, using algorithms, using all that in order to ensure economic democracy in the company. Right? Uh, theoretically, nothing would stop us from creating such a corporation today. But of course, it would be just as useless as what Robert Owen did in the 19th century, creating a little non-capitalist, you know, um, bubble in the middle of capitalism, right? In the end, it will die because capitalism will take it over. At some point, you know, people will die, you know, uh, capital is fantastic at taking over non-capitalist um, sectors or uh, bubbles. Uh, so the campaigns that I just put forward and which seem to, to find some favor with you, the whole point of that is to bring about the political revolution that will change corporate law. Because to have the cooperatives that I'm describing at the end of this book, you need to change corporate law. You are not going to change corporate law without a political revolution. So you need a political revolution to introduce a very simple rule that um, um, shares cannot be purchased or sold or leased. One per person, one share, one vote. That, you know, the, the corporate law, the piece of legislation is 10 pages. So technically, it's really very straightforward to to offer it. <laughs> but how do you pass it? You need a political revolution. So everything we said just before about how to bring down financialized capital, cloud capitalists, and so on, serves the purpose of creating the circumstances for the socialization of work, of production, distribution, um, okay. enjoyment, and so on and so forth. Uh, because the point is not to create, not to replace one kind of authoritarianism with a Soviet kind of authoritarianism. We've done that before; it didn't work out very well. <laughs> right. So democracy right. is good. We'll, we'll stick with democracy. Democracy is essential. Yeah. Uh, democracy is everything. But the question is, can you have democracy without one person, one share, one vote? I think not. Okay. Especially in the era of cloud capital. Makes sense. All right. All right. Well, I, we are definitely at our out at our hour. And uh, thank you for being here. Well, thank Thanks you. I, it just flew. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. So, so thank you very much, both Jim and David.